Okay, welcome, welcome to uh, HPL's Family History Research Center at the Clayton Library Campus. At the mouthful, that's our that's our new brand uh, brand name, but you and Bobby know us as Clayton Library. And uh, today we're doing Clayton Library Presents, McGovern Historical Center Resources for Genealogists. We have uh, Mr. Matt Richardson uh, sitting by waiting to help us out. He's an archivist and the, the special collections librarian there. And he's going to give us uh, some tips on how to use their resources in your genealogical studies. So uh, it looks to be very informative. Uh, We've already been chatting a little bit. I've already learned a little bit about the place, but I'm ready to learn more. We're going to give everybody a chance to, uh, to come in and get situated and and pull up a chair and open a beverage, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to pop into the chat, you can do that and just let us know uh, maybe where you're from, where you're watching from today. That's always a good topic. We kind of get to see where we reach and where people are uh, are settling in and watching us today. Hope everybody's in. Uh, nobody's in the uh, any bad weather or anything like that. I did. I did see there's some snow in parts of the country. I don't think we have anybody from over there, but but uh, you never know. We'll give everybody just a couple of minutes to get situated. Um, we usually we have an extra credit question of some kind. Um, I'm I'm not really certain what we're going to be able to ask about today. Maybe um, just maybe if have you ever uh, had uh, a need to go to the Texas Medical Center or have been to the Texas Medical Center, or maybe it uh, has been part of your family uh, family history at some point. Um, I know that they can really uh, help people. I know my family's benefited from the Texas Medical Center, uh, so um, be interesting to see what they have. What they have here at the uh, McGovern Historical Center. Let's see, do we have anybody else waiting to come in? No, that's pretty good. We'll wait, we'll wait another minute or two. Again, um, come on and get situated. I'll, let me post the handout for today. Let's see. No, that's not it. Just say it. Again, I hope everybody can hear and see OK. We've got our, our first slide up already. Uh, just introducing everybody to what's going on today. So let me get the handout information and then we'll get started. E.D. O'Brien from Houston says, my husband retired from Baylor College of Medicine. OK, that's something that would show up in the family history of working at Baylor College of Medicine. That's interesting. I did post the handout link in the chat. Hopefully you're not having any trouble finding the chat. Uh, let's see, we'll let Glenda Hayes in. OK. Give me about two more minutes. We usually start about five minutes after to see if we get anybody else showing up. We're doing pretty good. At 16 people. That's about half of what we thought we might have. Okay. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Anybody want to post where they're at today? Kind of usually get a few more posts than this. Maybe everybody's still getting situated. Just tired of saying where you're from, maybe. How about those Astros, huh? huh? That was a good game last night. Maybe everybody's still kind of groggy from staying up late to watch the Astros win. That was fun. Okay. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody to Houston Public Library's Family History Research Center at the Clayton Library campus. Today we are presenting McGovern Historical Center Resources for Genealogists. Um, that is going to be presented today by uh, Mr. Matt Richardson, who appears to have turned off his microphone. 
Matt, you there? Okay. There okay. we go. Okay. Trying to stay unobtrusive while you did no. the, the intro. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, the more the merrier. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll see you in just a moment. Let me go ahead and go through quickly what we have coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, we have uh, on uh, November 18th, we have Researching Women Community Cookbooks and what they tell us about our ancestors. That will be presented by Gina Philibert Ortega, who has uh, been with us before. She always puts on a very interesting program. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at uh, community cookbooks, something that we do have some of those here in the library. Uh, they usually include family stories, things like that. So. Very interesting uh, topic, of course, goes along with uh, the family gatherings we have in uh, the month of November, especially toward the end. Um, following that, on December 9th, our last uh, presentation of the calendar year will be basic Scandinavian research. That was being presented by Diana Smith. You might remember Diana Smith from a little bit earlier this year. She's joining us again, uh, helping you look for your Scandinavian ancestors, or at least how to get started. Is that I, I don't have any that I know of. Uh, I think that would be interesting to find out how to do it. Um, but I would not know where to start. So this is what I'm going to need to watch this. Now we are recording. Oh, excuse me, I got one more, one more. Inside the walls, the microfilm sources at the Clayton Library, unique sources to help discover your ancestors. So that's going to be uh, presented by the Clayton staff. That'll be our January 20th on January 20th. Uh, we're going to be looking at the micro print and microfilm uh, microfiche holdings that are here in the building. That's why it's called inside the walls. You have to come down here to take a look at them. And uh, there's quite a bit here, quite a bit to uncover that uh, uh, you're not going to find online. So uh, look forward to uh, to hearing about that as well in January. Now uh, we are recording today's uh, presentation. Matt's. Uh, very graciously allowed us to record it and we'll post it to our YouTube uh, page. Um, if you're interested in finding those uh, those recordings from previous uh, episodes or uh, webinars, you can go to youtube.com and search for the uh, Houston Public Library channel right there. And then when you can when you find that, you go to playlists right there and you will find the playlist. Uh, let's see. That is called HPL History Research Centers right there. So you can view that full playlist and you'll find uh, all the one, all the episodes that we have previously done uh, that have been recorded and posted as well as this one in the coming week or two. So uh, that is how you find that. So today we're going to be hearing from Matt Richardson. Now, Matt is the Archivist and Special Collections Librarian at the McGovern Historical Center of the Texas Medical Center Library. Aside from acquiring, processing, and preserving historical materials, one of his goals is to help communities connect to the archives. Now, prior to joining the MHC, he worked at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center, uh, part of the HPL uh, family, and University of Houston Libraries Special Collections. So uh, Matt, it's really good to, to have you here today and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. I'm going to trust that folks are seeing my screen now and if not, I expect an outcry in the chat, so should be good. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you all so much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. As he said, my name is Matt Richardson. And it will not be my first time on the HPL YouTube channel. It will not be my first time with the Clayton audience. Um, as he mentioned, I was formerly at the Houston History Research Center in their photo archives. And I've had the opportunity to um, do a lot of um, work with talking to the Clayton folks and doing other work with programs for HPL. And I'm very happy to be back with you all today. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an honor to be invited back as an outside speaker. Um, I'd been in touch with Sue when I began this job, Sue over there at Clayton, and I was getting excited when I first came to the MHC, the McGovern Historical Center, about finding new users for our collections and finding new opportunities for connecting to some of the folks that I'd encountered in my previous work with Houston history or with genealogy research, and wanted to think about different ways to bring our collections to 
new audiences, not just folks necessarily researching, you know, the history of MD Anderson or folks who um, may have more traditional medical history research topic. Um, we wanted to think about different ways that we could reach out and connect. So that's sort of the genesis of this. We hosted a tour for the Clayton staff at our library back a few months ago, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you all were interested in this topic and wanted to come and listen to us today. Um, so my plan for right now is to um, give you all a brief introduction to the TMC Library and McGovern Historical Center, and then from there to think a bit more specifically about some resources I have that I think could be of interest as you're doing your family history research. So there are all kinds of wonderful things here. I, I hope you'll come and check it out. Um, but my sort of guiding principle um, in selecting what to highlight for you all has been to find collections that are you know, quote unquote name rich. So things where you should have a pretty good shot of just searching for an, a last name, a surname, and turning up something specific in our collections. There are all sorts of other research strategies and ways of getting deeper into things, but I thought for the time we have today, that would be what I'd choose to highlight. So with that preamble, I will jump on in. So the McGovern Historical Center, or we call it the MHC, is the Special Collections Department of the TMC Library. Uh, we preserve and provide access to the historical collections and rare materials of the TMC's institutions, faculty, and staff. So TMC institutions and others can benefit from the center's collections contributing to healthcare, health policy, research, and education throughout the world. Um, we're actually the Houston Academy of Medicine, Texas Medical Center Library, John P. McGovern Historical Collections and Research Center. Um, so like Mitch pointed out with the Clayton Library, we have a thing for a flair for long names in our line of work here. So I try to stick to MHC or, or TMC Library to keep everybody sane, but it's, it's good to shout out the full name here and there. So we actually have two different sites. You can see the 8272 building there is where I'm sit sitting today. That's the headquarters, the Historical Research Center. And that is actually off-site. I hear I need my speaker volume to be louder. I'll try to enunciate here by the microphone. Hopefully that's better for folks. If that doesn't work, I will um, switch to a headset. Okay, so we are situated about three miles south of the main Texas Medical Center. We are in an off-site um, facility down by the Astrodome near 610 and Almeida Road. We used to be located in the main TMC library, and then a little thing called um, Allison came through and flooded a lot of things, and water and archives are not friends. So we went looking for a new home, and we've been located a couple miles off-site ever since then. It works out well for us. We have free parking, which is not the medical center's strength. And we also have uh, plenty of space for our archival collections in our climate control facility. But we do also have a location in the main Jones Library. That's the TMC Library Jones building you see there in the medical center, which is not to be confused, of course, with the Jones Library that is HPL's main library downtown Houston. So the origins of our library go back about 1915 when the Houston Academy of Medicine was assembling a library to serve the physicians of the Harris County Medical Society in Houston in the area. Then when Baylor came to town in 1949-ish, they merged the two libraries together, and that sort of is our beginnings as a collaborative institution. We're actually not part of any one um, hospital or medical school. We actually serve a variety of different organizations and constituents in the Texas Medical Center. So Baylor, UT, um, all kinds of different folks in the in the medical center are all sort of members of the TMC library. As things were getting underway, we started to accumulate rare books in the library beginning in the 30s. And then we started to build really significant collections in the foundations of medicine, North American public health, rheumatology, and other areas that we continue to develop and grow. As the library is expanding in the 70s, they added an expansion to the building and they also formally created the department that we're now in for the special collections and archives. And that's about the time in the 1970s where folks started reflecting on the importance of preserving the history of the Texas Medical Center and reflecting on the accomplishments of the people that built this up in the 1940s and 50s. And they began to collect oral history interviews with those people who helped build the medical center 
and they started collecting the papers and records of people who had been involved in creating the medical center. That's sort of the genesis of the archival side of things. And then that all comes together in our modern um, in our modern McGovern Historical Center as John McGovern, Dr. John McGovern, donated his collections and began to support us more extensively. I mentioned a little bit of this, but in terms of our collections, I just thought I'd use this exhibit we have on display in the main library to highlight that we do have strengths on rare books in the history of medicine, uh, public health in North America, dentistry. Um, we have the Menninger collection on psychiatry and psychoanalysis. When the Menninger Clinic moved here, um, their rare book collection and their clinical library came to us. We also have the Burbank Fraser collection on arthritis, rheumatism, and gout which is one of our more um, prestigious and older collections. And then we have the Dietering Collection on Psychiatry and Photography. And we also have um, quite a bit of like Texas, uh, Houston and Texas medical literature. Switching gears to the archival side of things. And this is where a lot of the stuff that's specific to Houston and the TMC um, is highlighted. And this is a lot of what I'll be dealing with today, more so than the rare books for this audience. We have a lot of things um, related to the institutions of the TMC. So you can see we have um, we have a photograph from the village, Lily Jolly and nurses there. Um, and we also have the Baylor College of Medicine, Colin Building Architectural Drawing, we have a, a Disney pamphlet produced for the Texas, Texas Children's Hospital when it first opened, aerial photographs of the TMC. We have films about the library's uh, architecture and expansion and dedication, um, reports and photographic rosters from the different schools, that's public health featured there. And then we have um, the two gentlemen you see seated there having a conversation or one of the video interviews we have with one of our physicians, uh, Dr. Richard Ruiz. And then sort of getting beyond the Texas Medical Center's people and institutions scope, we do get into some statewide, national, international coverage. We have records of the Texas State Board of Medical Examiners, who would be the body that you would apply to to take your exams to get your license in Texas. And then we have photographs from Medical World News, which was sort of a Time Off Magazine, glossy popular medical publication with nationwide and worldwide coverage. And then we have a lot of artwork, which is not something I expected when I first came here, but we have a lot of artwork related to the medical field. So there were there was a group called Medical Arts Publishing based in Houston that Dr. Arlie Clark of MD Anderson fame sort of spearheaded and brought in artists to create um, original art for this sort of specialized medical knowledge, but for the general practitioner physician. So the cancer bulletin, the heart bulletin, psych psychiatry, um, Psychiatric Bulletin all have original artwork and we have their artwork. And then one thing that's a little bit different than the rest of our collections, but related, we have the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission papers and records. And those are physicians and researchers who were in Japan in the um, beginning shortly after the bombing and after the war, who studied the effects on the population of the radiation. And a lot of those folks came back and ended up working in Houston in the medical center. And in the 80s, the archive made a concentrated effort to assemble their papers and have them available here. So just briefly, I'm going to take a breath and ask um, Bobby, I know, was at the TMC library. Has anybody else here been to the TMC library or to the McGovern Historical Center or, or had an occasion to ask us a reference question in the past? Just um, do a little gesture, wave, thumbs up icon, or jump into the chat if you've if you've ever dealt with us before. Not expecting a lot of yeses. It's part of the premise of this talk. Okay, I'll broaden it out. Um, I know you all have interest in family history research and genealogy, um, but. Who has done research in an archive or special collection? Um, I guess more broadly, not just um, not just Clayton, but if you've been to HMRC or somewhere else, I see a hand there. HHRC now, right? Okay. Got a couple of thumbs. Hey, there we go. Cool. Very cool. Excellent. 
good work. So I won't belabor the point just to say then that you know archives are different than libraries in several ways. Um, we're often attached to libraries, but for the most part, you're going to be encountering unpublished works, things that are created in the course of people's daily lives or daily work. So you're less likely to find you know, a publication, although we do have those, and more likely to find the correspondence, you know, meeting minutes from organizations, um, perhaps films or videos that were created and later edited and produced or all sorts of different artifacts. We have a wide variety of different things in our collections. You've got a bit, bit of a sampling here on the slide, but we do have extensive book and paper collections. We also have things like theses and dissertations for the medical schools. We do support them much as a traditional academic library would support a university. We do support the medical schools and have their records and have their theses and dissertations and so on. And we also have um, what we lovingly call the GAF section, the garments, artifacts, and frame objects. So you can see a slide of that there. We have a lot of different portraits and framed things, but we also get into a lot of old medical devices of sort of varying um, repute and quality. So uh, we put up on our Instagram the other day an example of one of these, and I think the caption was that it was, it ranged somewhere between useless and harmful. So there's all sorts of different historical developments and snake oil and, and quackery that we have some examples of here that can be a, a fun hook to get people interested in the history of medicine. But we also have some more um, historical and I guess you could say effective things. Like we have a Civil War surgical, like am Civil War era, like surgical amp amputation kit that we tried out for some class displays and things every now and then. But Point being, we have a wide variety of different objects and we do our best to catalog them and get the descriptions online so that people can ask us research questions and, and find the right um, answers to their questions or find something for their interests. And we also have, not on this slide, we also have an increasing share of more digital materials. We have a pretty good um, setup for dealing with digital materials, whether it be someone's CDs or old floppy disks or even a computer or hard drive. Um, and then we have a lot of film, audio, video equipment, and we're a very small archive. There's only four or five staff here, but we sort of, I think, punch above our weight in those areas. We have quite good resources and, and support and knowledge for the technical aspects of those things. All right, so I'm just going to talk a bit about access and how we provide our collections and how you can find them before we jump into the specifics of what we have here for you. But as you saw, we have two different locations. So we have two different reading rooms, just showing those here. One is our um, historical research center where I'm located, where you can see the card catalog, the bookcase, which we use as sort of an exhibit case displaying some interesting objects. And you can see a variety of things from the phrenology skulls to the heart pillow, to the photographs, to the books. And there's a mortal and pestle up there. And all kind, there's a life flight helicopter model and all sorts of fun objects. But you also see the, the camera from the D during photography collection. And back in the background, you see a University of Houston nursing school uniform, as well as Dr. Denton Cooley's uh, Eisenhower jacket from his military service. Uh, Dr. Denton Cooley, for those who don't know, was the heart surgeon at um, Texas Heart Institute, founded Texas Heart Institute, and did the first implantation of an artificial heart in a person. Uh, we have his original papers as well as a, a lot of actual film reels of his heart surgery techniques that would be recorded and then distributed for other students around the country and other uh, professionals around the country to learn how he did what he did. So those are actually online. We've got about 30 or so heart surgery videos on our on our website, if that's your bag. Uh, and then you see the other room, slightly fancier looking, is the rare books room in the main library. And this is where we could host you if you're researching uh, say, our 1543 uh, Andres Vesalius uh, Fabrica, which is a, a very unique and very significant anatomical text we have here. And we do try to reach out to folks and let people know we exist and let them know what sort of things we have. Obviously, we have talks like this, but we also put on exhibits. So you can see there we have an exhibit in our main library space so that hopefully med students and other folks using the main library space will be able to see us and learn a bit more about the history um, that's one challenge we have being off-site is to make sure that we're visible in the main library space because they get much heavier traffic than we do in our in our location. So we try to keep exhibits there. We also try to go and do in-person events from time to time. 
And you can see in the other slide, our, our department head Sandra Yates is giving a tour um, to students who are coming to look at different things in the archives. We do offer, we collaborate with classes at University of Houston downtown and Rice and other places to bring students into the archives doing research. And we also uh, will offer tours really for anyone who's interested. If anybody wants to follow up after this and, and see about a tour for yourself or your groups, we're happy to have you here and show you around. Um, we'd love to have folks come by. And then switching to the online access, because that's what it's all about right now, at least. Um, we do have a lot of information online. We have our website here, which is library.tmc.edu slash McGovern. Or you can just find it off the main TMC library page. And from there, you get all the usual stuff. Our open hours are about us, the sort of rundown of our collections. And we also have our blog where we post pretty regularly updates on what's going on with the collections and, and what you might want to get into. Um, so you can see news posted there. And from there, it links to our social media. We've got all the usual suspects, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'll put in a plug for our Instagram because that's been really going well. We've got a, an archives assistant who runs that and we post once a day. And there's a mixture of sort of historical knowledge and, whoa, look at this weird thing um, going on about months today. And then from there, you can get to our collections site, which is where we have our description. So this is the database you'd be searching in. This is the website you'd be searching through. So you can get to that off of our main page or at archives.library.tmc.edu. And this actually is fairly new. It went live in March of 2020, if you can believe that. So it's a very fortuitous time to get all of our collections online. Um, we have about 350 distinct archival collections that either come from a person or an organization, or in some cases, who knows where they came from. But typically it would be like the Denton Cooley papers or the MD Anderson hospital records, something by provenance tied to where it came from, who created it. And we have about 350 of those with their descriptions online. And for the most part, what you'll find by going and searching on our website is an inventory, is a description at the high level. This is 400 boxes containing this many things from this year to this year, created by this organization who did this based in Houston, and then go down to a hierarchy that gives you more detail about, okay, here are the office records, here are the yearbooks, here are the such and such, here are the photographs, here are the films. You can sort of navigate down that way to see what types of things are there. So. You can do subject searches, you can do name searches, you can do lots of different searches. Um, we think it's a pretty good system. Obviously, we're always trying to enhance it and get more description up, but that's the idea, is to get that information out so you all can use it. And you'll see the other slide there off to the right is you do have some digital content posted on that site. I mentioned it's typically going to be um, your just sort of catalog record inventory description of what the thing is. Then you contact us and say, hey, can I come and see the thing? Or, hey, if the thing's not too big, could you make me a photocopy of it? Or, hey, could you scan that photograph and send it high resolution? We can do all those things. But there are about 5,000 objects in the collection where we've got a scan, where the scan is just freely accessible online. We're constantly adding to that. So you can see some samples here. Uh, you see a couple of portraits. You see a couple of applications for, I mentioned, the Texas State Board of Medical Examiners. You can see we've got a few postcards. We've got about a, 1,500, maybe even 2,000 postcards of hospitals and other sort of medical sites around Texas, one of our largest digital collections right now. And then you see some photographs from the San Jacinto um, Lung Association, the Anti-Tuberculosis League, and other sorts of resources, just to give you a flavor for what types of things are going online. And then at the risk of confusing things, I also have a plug on there for Tarot, Texas Archival Resources Online which is a statewide portal that aggregates things from archives where you can go to one place and search and you'll get results from all over the state. So I know we're on there, University of Houston's on there, Rice is on there, um, Houston History Research Center, HPL is on there, Gregory School is on there and so on. So that's a nice site to go through if you're wanting to um, sort of cast a wide net. And we're, we're duplicated in both our local site and in that aggregator. Okay, so that's that's the lay of the land. That's who we are. That's what we do. 
Um, we're always excited to to grow our collections and add to them. And we're excited to, to reach new audiences like the one today. So as I as I mentioned, what I want to do is highlight a few different collections that I think might be useful in the type of research you're interested in and that Clayton is facilitating here. So broadly speaking, there are three categories of resources I think are of, of relevance here to highlight. We have our archival collections, we have our photograph collections, and then we have publications along the lines of yearbooks, rosters, uh, directories, and that sort of thing. So I'll get started with the archival collections. So I'm gonna be focusing, as I mentioned, on collections with a lot of names in them that you can actually type a name into that search site and get results right away. But I have to say that there are a lot of other ways to research our collections and a lot of other things you can find. So specifically, if you have a time and a place, we can definitely do some digging for you. Like if you know, I had a relative who was at um, you know, Baylor College of Medicine in the 1950s, or I have a relative who was involved in the auxiliary to the Texas Children's Hospital, Women's Auxiliary, uh, Texas Children's Hospital, The Watch, and did a lot of uh, community work with them, or even other organizations like Partners, which is a fundraising and, and support group for the UT School of Nursing. Um, or maybe I know that my relative or person I'm interested in went to study to be a nurse or was a nurse in Houston at such and such time. We can check and we have a lot of um, like class photos and yearbooks and scrapbooks for the nursing schools going back into the early 20th century. And even before the formal Texas Medical Center came along, we have a lot of that type of material. So you know that somebody was a, was a nurse in Houston in the 1920s. We have a few different collections we can say, oh, let's see if she's in this scrapbook. Or, oh, she might have graduated from this nursing school. Let's see if she's in the class photo around these years. So we can certainly do some digging if you have those kind of questions. But focusing on what you could search for today and just turn up something. The main thing I want to highlight from archival collections is this Texas State Board of Medical Examiners records. I've mentioned this a couple of times already, and this is actually the collection that got me uh, excited about reaching out to genealogists as an audience because this is a really rich collection and I think there's a lot of potential here and we're hoping to bring it to people's attention and get people aware of it. This actually, we've had for a long time, but we just got the description of online last year um, and about the time I started. And ever since then, it's been a matter of, okay, let's tell everybody we can about this. So around 1907, the state changed the way it handled licensing for physicians and created this new state board. And in order to be licensed as a physician in Texas, you would apply to the board to take an exam. You take the exam, you know, assuming you've done medical school and everything else, they'd approve you to take the exam. You take it, if you pass, you're licensed in Texas. So pretty straightforward, that's the, that's the genesis of it. And then it changes shapes later on in time and it still exists in a different, different name, different sort of scope, but that's the idea. And we have the applications of folks who are interested in getting the licensure for Texas. Um, the state archives, TSLAC actually have like the log books kept by the organization of all the people's names and details. We have the physical applications that a person would have filled out themselves and then submitted to the organization. And then those got boxed up and eventually came here. So I've got on the screen an example. Uh, this is Augustus Richardson. I couldn't help but search my own last name. Um, so he was born in Georgia in 1903 and he's applying for his Texas license in 1931. He's up in Prairie View. So this type of resource gives you a lot of different information. And the thing I can't get over is, you know, this is actually created by the person. It's not just a listing of the person like the log books in, in, in Austin are. So these applications, they do vary over time, uh, but for the most part, you're gonna encounter biographical information, like the person's name, birthday, place of birth. Um, you're gonna encounter, sometimes they'll have like height and all those kind of like, you know, um, physical markers as well. Um, You'll have their medical school attendance, and this often looks like the years they attended, um, but sometimes they also have grades or courses they took. And then you'll have, uh, depending on the file, there's a lot of them, most of them have letters of recommendation, which could be you know, someone in the community or a physician that's trained them or worked with them. And one of the nice things when you're looking for somebody, if, if they have a letter of recommendation, it probably says nice things about them. So it's always nice to 
to read something positive about somebody you're looking for, right? So, and then you'll have correspondence licensure, which is pretty dry. It's, you know, here's my $25 for the license, or here's, hey, we we don't have this thing from you, please send it, or here's your card to renew your license. But, you know, it's in there. And it's, again, it's often in their hand, which is nice to see and get signatures and all that. And then the really great thing is that a lot of these have photographs actually submitted by the person. So you saw the example here of, of Dr. Augustus Richardson, who got his photograph there attached to it. So as I mentioned, I've been really keen on promoting this and bringing people's attention. I think there's a lot of potential for folks to dig into it. Um, it is Texas wide and covers a good chunk of the 20th century. Um, there are about 6,000 folks represented, so it's not a huge collection, but, you know, if, if you have a relative or someone you're interested in who did practice medicine in Texas, um, I think there's a real chance that it could be worth digging into. You know, I've not found everybody I've looked for. I didn't find Denton Cooley's. I didn't find Dr. Benjamin Covington's. Um, so it's not perfect, but there are about 6,000 folks represented in there, so you can find some real, real good stuff if you're able to find one of your people. And we do have the names itemized on our website. So it's just a matter of typing in the name. If it's there, it'll pop up. Unless you've got a typo, of course, we're human. But basically, the idea that what I'm telling you about today is just type in a name. If it's there, it'll pop up. And we've been doing promotions with this. We had a blog post. We had an intern who was interested in surfacing stories of um, women of color in medicine in early, 20s, in early 20th century Texas. So she found a couple of folks and wrote blog posts about them, did some research into their stories. And then we created an exhibit out of her work. So you can see that exhibit here. It's actually currently on display in our main library. So we've got those folks, those two women on the bottom. Um, and then up on top, we found a couple other folks that I'd researched and found. Um, Carrie Jane Sutton was a black woman physician um, in Dallas area, I believe. And then Petra Bonilla, uh, Malonga de Toral was from Mexico and then came up here. And she was actually trained at the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. And so, uh, you all may or may not know, John Kellogg of Cornflakes fame was behind that. And he's the one who gave her the recommendation letter here. So we have um, her recommendation from Kellogg about her wonderful moral character. And they both, you know, were practicing in, in Texas. So you got all the uh, exams and everything done. And then I went looking for a few more stories to highlight for this exhibit, and I found Dr. Hezekiel Cortez um, Rodriguez, and he actually, I was very interested in his story because he lived down on the border, and he was licensed in Mexico but lived in Texas. And there are letters from the county judge and others saying we have a real physician shortage here in this rural part of the state. Um, it's something I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like we have three physicians: one is the dog catcher, one just died, and one is slammed with patients. So it'd be really nice if you could go ahead and. Get this guy approved because he's a wonderful man of great character and he practices medicine he just needs his texas license so we can get him on the up and up and, and help us out here um, and then the other one i've got on the exhibit next to him is dr moore yen who came from china in the 40s for his education and then there are letters from his colleagues at the hospital where he worked i think it was md anderson off the top of my head and they were letters saying oh because of um the changing political situation in China has made it impossible for him to return home. So please approve him to stay in Texas and practice um, his, his medicine here. He's been a wonderful colleague since he's been working here as a student or, or temporarily on staff. So just finding those individual stories, you know, the themes that really continue to resonate, I, I thought was really exciting. So I definitely, you know, there's a lot you can find in this collection, even if you just even if you're looking for an individual, you can see things about migration patterns. You can see things about trends in um, other other you know, employment and development and, and people's um, trends in medicine and medical history and Texas history too, not just medical. And taking that, well, what the folks at TMC Library did over many, many years uh, before I got here, so I can't take any credit for this, excuse me, was to build this roster of deceased Texas physicians, also called the Gazetteer, also lovingly called Dead Docs. So they took those 6,000 entries we had from these applications and typed them into catalog cards, into a database, pretty much. 
and then went to the Texas State Journal of Medicine, Dallas Medical Journal, and about 20 decades, or 20 decades, 20 years worth of obituaries. And they updated and added and added and added and created this resource we have on our on our digital commons website. Um, it's just a PDF right now, but it's online where we have listings of things like for all these deceased Texas physicians. So we typically have their name, their um, birthday, their death day, where they're from, where they went to medical school, and then a reference for where you can find out more about them, whatever reference we consulted to put it together. So this is also on our website um, and it has you know about twice as many entries as the actual archival collection. So it's it's you know fairly limited in the amount of information it captures. It doesn't have the same labor, I guess, as the original documents, but it does give you some some decent bits of information. All right, and switching gears out of the archival collections um, or to just a different type of archival collection, we do have a lot of photographs. And once again, always sticking to the things where you can have a pretty good chance of turning up something based on someone's name. But we do again have all of these nursing school class photos or uh, just examples of photography in the different hospitals and schools and lots of other types of things where we could go digging for things. Um, but as far as turning up names, the big one is going to be Medical World News. And this is not a resource I'd heard of before I came here, but this was a very um, popular by its niche standards publication um, designed to be sort of a glossy time life um, general interest medical uh, magazine for folks to be interested in new developments. So you'd have coverage of new new surgeries, you know, particular doctors or nurses, stories of patients, um, developments like the opening of a new medical school somewhere, all sorts of things, anything that sort of merited some news coverage automated into medical world news. This is our largest photo collection. It came here um, after the magazine closed and it has, we estimate, about half a million photographs in it. So we have the original, we have the printed, you know, published magazines complete run, which we're currently indexing so you can search for all the article titles and things. Um, but we also have the prints of the images that have been selected to print in the magazine. And then we also have the negatives shot by the photographers so in many cases. So it could be that if you say, oh, I know my uncle was, you know, went to this, went to Penn State's medical school the first year it opened and they just had a big class reunion. And he thinks he remembers that they had a story in this magazine when the class first was um, graduating. And if you look and see, we can find it in the magazine. We can find the pictures that were printed. We go back into the negatives and see if there are any more pictures beyond the ones that were covered. And these, in many cases, are listed biographically. So we have them according to the articles, but also a lot of pictures according to biography. So you can see here, a look at our collections inventory, look at our system. Where this is just a list of you know a b through a l of folks that we have a biographical file for a photograph from that collection for so once again if you're on our collection site typing in a last name and if it's there it can pop up just go right to this and tell you right where it is and what box it's in we can go get it for you Another one on the other end of the spectrum, much more specific, much more local, much smaller, are the Joseph Maurer portraits. So these, um, first of all, if that name is familiar, HMRC, HHRC does have a uh, Maurer photo collection as well. He's a commercial photographer in 20th century Houston. Um, but he had one job where he was working for the Harris County Medical Society. And he later donated those negatives and those images to us, um, separate from the rest of his photo collection. He was interested in having those preserved in the medical context, I suppose. And um, this would be this would have been used to create the Harris County Medical Society's pictorial roster. So they every year would publish a list of doctors with their specialties and biographical information. They'd have a photo next to it. So you know, not quite a yearbook, but not too far afield from one either. And he produced these portraits, and then we have the 1,400 or so portraits of the folks in the Harris County Medical Society from 54 to 60. So again, it's a pretty specific thing, but if, if somebody was practicing medicine in Houston at the time, there's a fair chance they'd be represented here. And we do have that online. You can see the shot again of our website, of our collection database, and there are the names as well as their specialties or what they what type of practice they had and then the year of the photograph. 
So it gets pretty specific pretty fast and should be pretty easy to surface something if they're if they're included there. These, like the medical world news ones, are not digitized yet. But we do have a pretty substantial digital collection of Memorial Hospital photographs. So this is another big photograph collection. There's about 4,000 images, and we've got almost 1,000 of these digitized and online with, with pretty good metadata. So you can find folks who were at Memorial Hospital um, for a good chunk of the 20th century. I've got 1903 to 1979. I think it's stronger on the earlier side of that. Um, but one nice thing about this one is it's not just the doctors. It has all sorts of different positions um, and folks who worked at Memorial. So, and maybe even going back into the Baptist Sanitarium before it became Memorial. Not sure about that. But this is going to have folks just looking at the sample that's here on the screen. There's a pastor, a trustee, a secretary, a student, um, a librarian, a nursing technician, director of nursing education. Okay, so there's a lot of different positions. So you get a name, a position, and a year on most of these, and you're going to have a better chance of finding folks who were not doctors, but might have been some of these other administrative roles or support roles or um, other leadership roles. So it's a bit more inclusive than some of the other collections. So that's kind of a nice thing. And like I said, 940 of these are digitized on our website and you should be able to search them uh, just by name and, and pop something up there if they if you have somebody. So definitely one we're proud of and one we're trying to get more and more content from. And uh, finally, getting into our last sort of segment of the collections I wanted to highlight for y'all. We do have um, yearbooks, rosters, directories, that sort of thing. In many senses, um, we're different from your traditional academic library you think of. We're not attached to just one specific institution. We serve many different institutions. Um, but we are, at the end of the day, an academic library. We support students. They just have to be med students as opposed to undergraduates. So we do have the yearbooks um, for the medical schools for many of them, and a lot of the other sort of resources that would go along with that. I was going to add also just keeping in mind once again that um, there may be additional places we can look for you. If you know someone was at Baylor, for instance, we had someone in the chat mention Baylor. Um, it's going to take a bit more digging to go and see if they made it to the yearbook. That's fine. We can, we, we're happy to have you come down to our reading room. Uh, we can do a limited amount of searching for you uh, remotely. So it's not going to be just a matter of like typing in a name and they pop up in the case of these type of resources I'm talking about now. But it could be if you have a place and a time, oh, Baylor in the 1960s, oh, we've got those yearbooks, you want to come take a look? And it could be um, a fun little hunt. So I won't belabor the dates too much. I do have them on here for reference, but I won't spend too much time parsing that because I don't want to over overload you with that bit of detail. But we do have yearbooks for Baylor and UT Med School, the McGovern Medical School. Um, for a lot of their their runs, um, obviously that type of resource kind of dries up as you get into the 2000s, which is a, a problem all over. But we do have a lot of um, th these materials, and they look like most other yearbooks. It's a bunch of you know uh, students having a good time for the most part, and they're they're really fun to look at, and they do have the sort of standard yearbook features that you'd be used to. Um, we also have directories and rosters from Baylor, so there's a bit more. Slightly different type of resource, but similar idea. And then going back a bit further, I wasn't going to stress dates, but I will say the dental branch records go back a bit further. The yearbooks go back to the 20s. Um, that's changed names and changed forms a couple of times, but we have some scattered yearbooks, directories, and class photos for the dental branch as well. So we have dentists included as well as the um, as the medical doctors. And then we also have. Um, Stuff from other schools besides the um, medical schools, we have the UT School of Public Health, Wood Hospital School of Nursing, and uh, uh, several other folks, uh, several other organizations that are that are in the business of educating folks to be in the healthcare professions. Um, that have different uh, either yearbooks or photographic rosters or directories, and there's just an example from UT Public Health, which we recently processed that collection. And on the other side of things, in addition to the schools, there are also, of course, the hospitals, which we do support. And MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, we have their directories, similar with St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital, 
Um, most of these organizations I'm mentioning, we have larger archival collections for that would have newsletters and meeting minutes and reports and all sorts of different archival documents sort of accumulated. But um, again, I'm just highlighting the things that I think would have a pretty accessible um, set of names for you all to be researching the family history in. And these directories are typically going to have something like, you know, someone's name, their department, their position, and their phone number, which probably doesn't do a lot of good now, but it's in there. Um, so directories, staff rosters, that sort of thing would have for several of the hospitals. So you could at least, um, if you have a sense that somebody worked at such and such place in such and such time, you could confirm that, or you could maybe nail down what area of it they worked in, that sort of thing. And then I've mentioned the Harris County Medical Society, their pictorial rosters. This is what um, Bauer worked on taking those photographs. We have the negatives for, but there's just an example of what the books look like. And this is from a larger archival collection, but I picked out these rosters. And that's a pretty good date range from 51 to 2008. So we've got pretty good coverage there. And it's just, a, it's a directory of the folks who were a member of the society. They typically will have their name, um, some basic information, where they went to medical school, what their specialty is, that sort of thing. So again, trying to confirm some professional information or maybe their education is going to be showing up in there. And similarly, the Postgraduate Medical Assembly of South Texas sort of was around before the UT Medical School. It was a place for folks to get continuing education, professional development in medical areas. And we have their membership lists, so that would be able to confirm people's you know, locations, maybe some professional details, and their names are all going to be in there. All right. and. There's so much more, but that's where I think I should try to bring this to a close. Um, and I just want to try and pull all that together um, in terms of our collection site, in terms of our resources, in terms of some of the things that you might want to take away with, take away with, and uh, think about. And I just have here on my last slide a example of a search result. And I just typed in Richardson. I didn't try to qualify it. I just went to the very first search box on our collection site, typed in my last name. And here's an example of what comes up. So I, I don't, I'm not sure how, how well y'all can read it, but I see Richardson Dalton is part of the Texas State Board of Medical Examiner's Records, which I mentioned those licensure records. Uh, Richardson SC and Richardson James J, also Texas State Board of Medical Examiner's Records. But then I get Richardson Alfred W shows up in 1963 in the Medical World News Photographs. Richardson Henry B is in the Hilderbrook papers, um, which is another collection I didn't even get into, but uh, we can check it out and see what's going on there. And then uh, thankfully we have a couple of digital objects that show up of our scans. So Everett Richardson, the dermatologist, Everett Richardson Seal, the dermatologist from the Memorial Hospital photographs I mentioned, that dates from 25 to 30, so that's one of the older ones. And then another um, Board of Medical Examiners, Richardson William Augustus, who you saw earlier, and we have his file there, and that one's already been scanned online. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what you can expect to see if you just type in a last name in our collections site. Um, not to say I'm necessarily related to any of these folks, but that's just a really quick, easy way to get into our collections and begin to see what turns up. And it does, I was happy to see it validated my theory that these are the collections you would get results in because uh, I just did this search yesterday, and sure enough, those were the results. So it covered a lot of the ground I've spoken with about today. And with that, I'm going to bring it to a close. I would love to hear from y'all. I hope you have luck searching our sites. I hope this sounds like a resource that is of interest to you or that you'd like to share with others. Um, my contact information is there. Be sure um, I'm happy to have you reach out. Um, Sandra Yates is our department head. Her information is on there as well. And then um, our general contact information for the McGovern, as well as all sorts of links to our website and blog and social media. And um, with that, I thank you again for listening. Thank you for coming. And uh, I'm happy to, to take questions or discuss further with y'all. Okay, Matthew, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. That was very interesting. Uh, I didn't realize there was so much uh, available that you had both in person and, uh, oh, my camera is doing something very strange. Um, let me just turn it off. Um, uh, yeah, the online stuff, I was really uh, happy to see a lot of the online uh, material that you uh, made available through your scanning efforts. We're doing some of that here as well, and it takes a lot of work to to get all that stuff available uh, online for people to to see. Um, I think it uh, 
it, it's it seems like it's it's always a gap in a lot of uh, family histories of just what somebody did, you know, maybe at a job. Um, I, I know lots of times the fact, you know, where they were during college is kind of a hole sometimes. They, just, oh, they went to college, but but we don't know exactly where or, or what they did. Or And I think it's really interesting that, to be able to find out some of that for at least some people. Um, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about now, uh, I mean, not everybody is fortunate enough to have a, a, a doctor or a surgeon, you know, in the family, but uh, it seemed like there were lots of students and faculty uh, besides just the uh, the MDs uh, that you have in your collection. Is that right? Yeah, there are. I mean, it varies by collection because some of them, you know, like the Harris County Medical Society are, are more targeted towards the physicians. But as I was trying to show with the memorial photographs or even some of the things I didn't get into, like just giant archival collections. You know, we have, um, I can tell you, but hundreds of boxes from Herman Hospital from its entire existence, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And we have a giant collection from Texas Children's as well. And, you know, the majority of the records that are created in there are someone's office files. You know, these are, these are created by people, secretaries and clerks and people working, just doing day-to-day -day office work. So, mm. yes, it's it's sort of easy, you know, to find the Denton Cooley stuff, but um, there is a lot of stuff. It takes a bit more digging, but if you know that somebody just simply worked in a place, because think about the incredible number of people that are employed in the Texas Medical Center. Um, so, with all different levels of education. Um, mm. So, it's more of a dive, I think, because their names won't be called out as much, but if you know what department or what time or something like that, you can, you know, give us a call and we can look into some boxes and, and maybe get somewhere with it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you may not be lucky enough to get like a, a, a nicely posed uh, portrait uh, for some people, but you, I think it seems like you're going to find some information about their daily, you know, their job activities or daily lives and that can fill in a lot of gaps for people. Like every archive, we have tons of identified, unidentified photographs, which we mm -hmm. would love to to make some headway on. But I'll just I'll just take that opportunity to say a couple of my favorite things that I found in the collections here have been correspondence from secretaries, executive assistants for for mm -hmm. a couple of uh, big shots in the TMC. Um, there was one person who was in Japan with the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and after I believe it was Grant Taylor, I'll be getting it wrong, but he, he went back from Japan and came to UT and she was just continuing to update him. So we have all of her letters updating him on all the goings on in their office and hearing <laughs> not like the official reports, but hearing like her voice and all the like backstory and goings on, like fun, uh -huh. just like filling him in on all the stuff uh -huh. and so much more like character and voice and interest for me. And there's a similar thing with um, Dr. Berger's assistant. Um, he would go, he was being treated for cancer and he would go up to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota and she would write him about all the goings on when they were first forming the TMC and send him all these notes and and hearing her voice, you know, she's not a famous mm -hmm. person, but we have her name and we have her writing and just getting to engage with those angles into the history and not just the sort of very like high level official stuff has been has been a really rich sort of thing just for me to to come across. Sometimes you have to look back and, and see uh what you know what was listed on a census record for what somebody did to find out oh that person was a you know, was actually a nurse you know maybe i yeah. could find something here yeah. um uh, now as far as like hospital records and things like that we're not talking about medical records are we for for patients let's just say no for simplicity's sake um no, okay we're, we're, not, we're not a repository for medical records yeah um, we do get we do get phone calls for folks wondering about that and we usually end up sending them to the hospital or the county or whoever it may be, um, those inevitably sort of, you know, creep into doctor's collections or whatever, where they mm -hmm. may not have filtered out all that stuff. We restrict those materials. So if you're going looking for that stuff, no, we're not really going to have it for you. I know that there are some people that need to do research on things like um, psychiatric hospitals, things like that. Is there any anything like that? There is. Um, there's a I think there's probably two, two ends of this, and I'm not sure how helpful uh -huh. one is. Um, 
We do have some Texas materials on that that I'm just not very familiar with, so I can't speak to, but mm -hmm. certainly, certainly reach out to us and we can see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, we actually have an intern right now who's processing the Dietering, I mentioned the Dietering Psychiatry and Photography Collection. Mm -hmm. He was interested in particular, like in 19th century, like development of the idea of these two fields of photography and psychiatry working together and, mm -hmm. and documenting people's you know, physical form with their mental state. And there's a very, it's, it's complicated stuff, but yeah. um, there's a lot of asylums, but that's on a national and international scale. Um, he has a lot of books about that, but also he produced an exhibit, a couple of exhibits where he presented some of the information that he'd come across in his research. So that's like right in the front of my mind right now, but that's not, um, it's not local, you know, national, international too. But um, yeah, if that's somebody's interest, um, we don't, I don't know what we have in that, honestly. I know we have some things, so just, just reach out mm -hmm. to us. You're based in the Texas Medical Center, but are you exclusively ab about the Texas Medical Center? Yes, but no. Um, you know, I could, I could be the the big booster and say, well, you know, we have an international impact with all the great things happening in the TMC. Mm -hmm. um, but no, we have, um, we are focused, our, our mission, our, uh, our core sort of reason for being here is to document and support the TMC and, and you know, Houston and Texas medical history, um, you know, in the sense that we're more or less an academic library concerned with the the schools and the hospitals here and, and also some of the private physicians and organizations in the area so that's sort of first and foremost but inevitably things get bigger like the fact that we have the medical world news photograph collection is a larger collection the atomic bomb casualty commission is a hugely like visible we have probably more japanese researchers than american researchers using that mm -hmm. um, or at least you know comparable um but that came through us because a lot of those folks came to the tmc like grant taylor and and Jack Shul, um, and they started getting interested in having all that stuff brought together and archived mm -hmm. when it comes here. So, so first and foremost, it is the history of the TMC in the Houston and Texas medicine, but inevitably it gets bigger than that. And we have well, Dr. Phil Pinch's collection. He was mm -hmm. up at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, but he got the Nobel Prize in 1950 for discovering cortisone with a couple of collaborators. Okay. That came to us because we have a strong collecting history in rheumatism and gout and arthritis. So uh, going along the line of, of of the collections and things that you have, Matt, uh, do you what is uh, what is the the bar for submitting something to uh, McGovern? Say say my ancestor left behind uh, some some papers, a doctor that left behind some papers, uh, a list of deliveries or or something like that, rural de rural baby deliveries. Would that be something you would be interested in? Or the answer is probably yes. <laughs> uh, we're always looking to add to the collection, and you never know when you know when something just amazing is going to fall in your lap. Um, it's another reason for just wanting people to know we're here. So, you know, typically we just say contact us and it's case by case and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. But if it's within our collecting scope, if it makes sense, if, particularly if it's Texas, we're probably going to be interested. Um, if it's beyond Texas, we might look for a different archive that might be more appropriate to refer you to, depending on what else, what other, um, how large the collection is and how relevant it might be to our mission. Mm -hmm. like said, we have we have Phil Pinches because A, he has a Nobel Prize, and B, we have a collection in rheumatism, arthritis, and gout, so it fit his his area. Right. Um, but yeah, if you, you know, a lot of the donations we've had in the last year or two have been somebody has a very small collection, just, you know, not much thicker than a book or two of their um, their ancestors' nursing school scrapbook or her nursing school yearbooks, um, or somebody's, you know, personal papers, photographs of their time. Um, it's actually been a lot of nursing school stuff in the last year or so coming in, which is great to, mm -hmm. to have it not just be the doctors. Um, but yes, if you have somebody in your family or that you come across or, you know, see that has sort of just uh, any sort of history in healthcare, and we're also, you know, very much looking to sort of diversify our holdings, have more different types of healthcare professionals, have more different types of folks who worked in these areas, um, folks from different backgrounds. So definitely we'd love to have that conversation. The bar, okay. I wouldn't say the bar is low, but we are definitely not wanting anybody to like avoid talking to us. We want people to feel like they should approach us, that we want everybody mm -hmm. to feel like their family history is important and worthwhile. Yeah, especially if people want to share it, make it right. available to more people. Now, you met, you were talking about yearbooks, and you mentioned that, they, that, that there's a problem with them kind of petering out in the, uh, in the early to mid 2000s. Would you care to talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. I mean, that's that's my personal observation. I guess that does not reflect the opinions of the TMC library. 
but no, I, I was at University of Houston for a while, and I believe they'd stopped publishing the physical yearbook when I was there in mm-hmm. 2015, 16, something like that. Um, and I just noticed from my own, you know, looking at our collections here that I think we have Baylor through 2012 and UT through like 2005 or something. They may or may not have continued to publish them. Uh, but there's also usually a bit of a time lag in stuff making it to the archives. You know, we don't always mm-hmm. have the 2019 version of something. We may have like the 2012 or 2005. So mm-hmm. hopefully there's a few more things in offices out there that will come over here when somebody notices or retires or needs more space or something. They'll give us a call and say, oh, I've got these old yearbooks. Um, but that's just been kind of my personal observation in different jobs I've had is that it's, you know, it's expensive to produce yearbooks and, and the demand mm-hmm. for them has changed, I think, since people have been getting more and more things digitally. I mean, if you think about one of the big purposes of a yearbook being, you know, to to document people, to give pictures of people and records of people, um, there's other sort of digital services that accomplish that. And I think yearbooks are fantastic. I, I, I am worried about uh, people trying to do that type of reminiscing and research without them, but it's been my observation mm-hmm. that they're not as they're not as common as they had been. Yeah, I know what you mean, uh, but I think you're right. I, I do think the the movement online for a lot of that stuff is just more cost efficient yeah. uh, for as far as cost and as far as far as distribution. But it leaves something a little less for the archivist to to, to handle. Um, yeah. So um, I don't see any other questions. So the you have a blog listed here, the Black Bag. Is that a blog ab- about McGovern? Yes, yeah, so the black bag is in the 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 house called Doctor's Bag that they walk around with. We have a small collection of doctor's yeah. bags here, which we have a lot of fun um, ephemera and, and uh, objects. Um, yeah, we tend to post things if there's a new collection that's just come in or been processed, or like right now we're working through a large um, set of audiovisual resources. We got a small grant from the um, South Central Academic Medical Libraries Consortium. <laughs> they they funded us uh, digitizing about 50 videos about the library, about the TMC. Um, those are some of those oral history interviews I mentioned, as well as some videos of the you know of, of developments in the library itself, some promotional things, some news coverage, that sort of thing. And we just got those digitized. So I've been writing uh, stories about those. They've been going uh, online and sort of promoting that new mm-hmm. collection. So it's typically sort of like what's new in the McGovern. Um, what's newly available for for researchers? So, do you, do you make that available as a newsletter too? Um, the library has a um, well, it's on it's on our website and also on WordPress. So you can subscribe and get updates whenever it comes out. But you can also okay. the library, like TMC Library, bigger than McGovern, has a um, a library newsletter you can subscribe to on the main library website, mm-hmm. and we get um, one or two stories in there each time. It's usually just the blog gets sent into the the newsletter you can subscribe to. So, sure. Yeah. Just a way to kind of keep up with yeah, anything so new. Now we do have a question coming in from uh, Arletha uh, asking if you have any records on Herman Hospital for crippled children. Okay, good question. I'm actually, I'm not familiar with that exact hospital or, or department or area, but we, I will say we have, we have the Herman Hospital records. So we have, I want to say it's four or 500 boxes of Herman Hospital records. So if that is a, a part of the Herman Hospital, it's almost certainly there. I'm not immediately familiar with it, but we can certainly look. Um, now I'm curious. I know we have a lot of things. Um, we have some images and videos from Shriners um, Hospital for Crippled Children. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a few other things like that. We we um, have a few different sort of pediatric focused areas, and we also have TIER, the Institute for Rehabilitation and Research. Um, and that's now part of Memorial Herman. We have tier records and Dr. William Spencer, who was at tier, did a lot of um, look from polio treatment to more broad rehabilitation. So we actually have a, a pretty strong archival holdings in sort of like, you know, mid-century rehab, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but certainly Herman Hospital, very, very huge collections. So there's probably something in there. Yes. Well, no, Herman Hospital has a, has. Herman Hospital has a long history. What yeah. happens, I'll, I may put you on the spot here, what happens to a hospital's records uh, when they go, when they close? Well, if if everybody is lucky, they come here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, this is all done by humans. Um, nobody is perfect and there mm-hmm. are no, to my knowledge, there's not any like mandate that anything um, would have to come here specifically. Um, mm-hmm. I think, 
Um, in some archives, there's like an actual like records program and there's a sort of a law, like a state law or city law or something that says your records must go to this place. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how hospitals operate as far as that. I know they have their own sort of obviously there's things like uh, HIPAA where they have to be protect, protecting patient privacy and, and showing they're complying with certain laws. Right. Um, so that would certainly be a factor at this point, especially now with digital information. And so much stuff now is locked up in proprietary software that it, it would be um, more, it's going to be more challenging for people to just boxing up an office. It's going to be a matter of how do we get this data out of this database and get it transferred somewhere where it can be sustained. Sure. Um, sure. But yeah, I think, you know, for the most part, what we encounter a lot um, are retirements and uh, deaths, honestly. And people reach out to us and said, oh, uh, my, 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 partner has passed or where um, this building is closing or this person is leaving the institution mm -hmm. um, and they want to send it, you know, space is always a factor, right? And people are always like, okay, this, right. this place is closing, this stuff has to go, but we think it's important. That's sort of mm -hmm. where we get the call. Um, and the more people know about us, the more like we are to get those calls for the time. Right, comes. right. Um, and and you're looking for them. You You want them. I don't know the backstory between us getting the Herman Hospital archive, but then we have gone back to the estate. We have the Herman estate, like property records and all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff like that from, from back to Herman's death, uh, back mm -hmm. when they started the hospital. Wow. Um, so there's lots there to dig into too, as far as property records. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a hospital closing, uh, that's a big thing. A, a hospital merger, I think, you know, again, people start looking at office space, but people also tend to be legacy minded and think about like, oh, well, I know that this is important, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there, as much as Houston may not have the reputation, uh, there's a lot of people out there who know that these things are important, that they're milestones, that they deserve to be preserved, and people will care about meeting them someday. And, and we think about it, you know, part of what we do is a service to those people and those institutions to be able to actually care for and, and mm -hmm. properly, like, care for and maintain and store and make accessible those legacies so that people well, can come along later and tell the stories. Sure. Make sure that those stories are preserved for, for somebody in the future that might might be want to look back. Um, I see that you replied to Edie and uh, telling Edie that uh, to contact you and maybe look up somebody who had worked uh, at TMC. Yes. Yeah. Anybody who has a um, I think she had a husband at Baylor. But yeah, anybody who has a specific mm -hmm. question, I'm I'm happy to dig into it. I won't be able to keep up with all of your names from this so please do email me or mcgovern at library.tmc.edu and mm -hmm. you can, to, to do some looking so i think we can get somewhere with some of these things you're bringing up i don't see any more questions so uh I, matt i'm just going to thank you for your time and for your presentation uh very uh, uh illuminating on um, something that i think a lot of people don't even realize is there so thank you again very much thank you so much for having me i appreciate the opportunity and uh Thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon, and uh, I'll see y'all here soon, I hope. All right, thank you, all. We're going to move on over to talking about our research hours here at Clayton. We are open Tuesday through Saturdays, 10 to 5, except on Thursday, when if you're running a little bit later, you can come in. We're open 12 to 7 on Thursday for you uh, afternoon or late or early evening researchers. We've got you covered as well. Uh, come on by. As you can see, we've got a newly remodeled uh, uh, research area. We've got new, com you don't see them there. We do have new computers out. We have uh, uh, quite a few new things since the pandemic. It kind of sat there empty and unused for a little while, but uh, we're starting to see people come back and we're really happy to see that. So come on by if just to see the new, uh, the, the new digs that we have. You'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, if you uh, have a family history research question, or maybe you need a live or virtual group presentation, uh, we we do those. We take uh, family history questions through email and over the phone. We do uh, we do some lookups for you. Uh, you can give us a call at 832-393-2600. That's our main number. And you can uh, email us with your, if it's a, a more detailed question, you can send us a little bit of background information and your question, uh, please one question at a time, to uh, cla.reference at houstontx.gov. That's cla.reference at houstontx.gov. So uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming on by. 
Um, uh, Matt wants me to let you know that the uh, that McGovern is open Monday through Friday, nine to five to the public. No membership needed. And as you said earlier, parking is free. That's a that's a big park. We have par we have free parking here as well. So um, uh, there's no reason to come on by. It's not going to cost anything. And you you're probably going to find out something that you didn't know and find out something, some aspect of your family you didn't know. So um, for everybody here at Clayton, I want I'd like to thank uh, Sue. She couldn't be here today to to uh, run things, but uh, uh, she was here in spirit. And I'd like to thank Matt again for uh, for presenting uh, such a wonderful uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, just like to remind everybody to be good to each other and to uh, cite your sources. <laughs>